this is the Provoke Prawn, and this is the Fractal Design Torrent. This is a build video where I'm going to be showing you how I built this machine and what's included in the box with the white edition of the Fractal Design Torrent, talking to you about the various highlights of it, showing you the build process and the things that I encountered along the way while building it, and hopefully sharing all the information you'll need to do the same build if you're interested. Now, I've done a shorter review video which is essentially just a highlight of all the different features and highlights and lowlights of this case but this is going to be a lot more in depth starting obviously with the unboxing process you see the case itself and some fan brackets make note of those fan brackets because they will potentially be used if you're replacing the standard fans and that's one of the immediate highlights of this case is that it comes with a multitude of fans pre-installed it has two 180 mil fans on the front and three 140mm fans on the bottom. Now this is going to vary depending on the setup you purchase. This is the white case obviously, but you can get an RGB one which has RGB fans in it. Unfortunately that's only available in black, but I think it's worth noting. I personally prefer the look of the white case with the tinted glass side panel, tempered glass, but I really wish this had RGB in it. What you will see at the end is there was one RGB lighting strip in there, and I'm going to talk about how you set that up later on but otherwise it has fans without any RGB lighting. It's also worth noting that I purchased an additional fan for this setup and I'll talk to you about why as we go through. Now this is a very much an air focused case. It has large intake fans on the front and the ones on the bottom are also intake. What you'll notice from these clips is that there is a large venting system at the front with some mesh panels behind it, which I'll show you in a minute. And it also has a wonderful intake on the bottom because it has some large feet that raises it quite high up off the desk or off the floor. Preferably you'll keep this on the desk, but it, it does have dust filters on the bottom and on the front to prevent dust ingress. Now, there are some oddities in terms of the exhaust, and we'll talk about that as we go through. And I also benchmarked it to show you the sort of temperature performance, and I'll go cover that information at the end. The case comes apart wonderfully easily. It has removable side panel, top panel, and rear panel as well. The side one is held on with just clips, so it just pulls away nice and easily, as you can see, and then you get access to the fans. Now, it is possible to switch these fans out if you so wish, and it will also fit up to 420mm radiator for a liquid cooling system, either on the bottom or on the front or both. So if you go for a hard loop liquid cooling system, putting that in here is a possibility. However, in this instance, as you saw from that initial clip, I'm using an air tower CPU cooler from Noctua, which I've done a video on separately, and focusing on using the standard pre-installed fans just because they're so magnificent. The front panel comes away by pulling on the top and there's some clips holding that in place. And then you'll see there's another dust cover on the other side of that, which essentially is a fine mesh that will stop dust ingressing. It's really easy to get that out. Also with that front panel off, you can pull the bottom tray out as well. That comes out through the front. So every now and then you can take those out, give them a clean and ensure that they aren't choked with dust and dirt that's preventing your case from running as cool as it should. Now this is a wonderful setup in terms of those venting, but also just the sheer size of the fans. Having so many fans pre-installed in a case is a wonderful thing. You'll see a lot of modern cases around this price point that have no fans at all included. So having these is obviously a bonus. Large 180 mil fans on the front means it has a wonderfully quiet and yet powerful cold air intake on there. And then you obviously have a lot of cold air coming from the bottom as well with those 340 mils. This case can take up to a multitude of different motherboard setups. I'm using an ATX motherboard, but you can put in EATX and others. And I'll show you the process for that later on. And then you have two front panel USB connections, two audio ports and a USB-C connection as well, which I'll talk to you about in a bit more depth in a minute. Now the top panel comes off with two thumb screws at the rear and then that just pops off there. This gives you access to where you're going to be installing the power supply unit and you can fill up to a 230 mil power supply unit in here. In this case I'm going to be using the Corsair RM850X. You will also notice there are holes for liquid cooling ports so if you're going to be filling up a reservoir you can do it up here and there's plenty of places for cable ties and other things. Now this is an interesting design seen a PSU at the top. It was an old fashioned sort of setup. Actually a lot of old cases used to have 
the power supply unit at the top. The thing with this case that's interesting is if you don't get an extra exhaust fan, you're essentially going to be exhausting all the air from the case through the power supply unit and out the back. So that's something to note. I'll talk to you a bit more about that in a minute. Now, when you take the back panel off, you'll see there are a lot of things going on here. You have a lot of cable management loops, uh, Velcro ties, and there are some on the back as well for the outside, which is quite interesting. But you'll see there are also various different hooks for plastic cable ties, so you can really tie things down, and you obviously have ports through to the front. You have a space for up to four SSDs and two hard drives. And one of the other main highlights of this case is that thing in the bottom left of the case, which is a PWM fan controller. So you can plug the fans that are included in the case into that and then plug that into your motherboard and to the power supply unit. And then you can control the power of all the fans from one controller, which is excellent because it means you don't have to plug in all the fans to the different headers on your motherboard. It makes cable management nicer and it makes control easier. And it's a really nice inclusion in the case. And this is a brilliant addition and a simple one with one little quirk that I'll get to a bit later on. These little trays just above that are for the SSDs, and I'll show you the mounting process for that in a minute. But as I said, you can have up to four 2.5 inch SSDs installed in here, and then two standard platter hard drives installed on the right hand side. Obviously, you do then have to manage the cables, which I think if you installed that many drives would become a bit tricky. So it's worth bearing in mind. I also think that there's not quite enough room back here, personally, in the back of the case, and I'll show you what I mean and why a bit later on. But that will really depend on your cable management skills, how neat you can be, etc. Here you can see the power supply cable and the fan control cable from that PWM controller. You plug those into your motherboard and the power supply unit, and I'll talk a bit more about that later on. And then on the right hand side, the two hard disk drive trays. You also have large bit of access to the back of the motherboard here once that's installed as well, which is obviously great if you're installing any sort of system and you need to get to the back of the plate to install a back plate for the CPU cooler, you can do that. Down at the bottom tied off is the front panel connection. So you have the USB-C connection, which is this one here. Then you have that fat USB-A connection. So that's for the two front panel USB-A connections. And then you also have the power and reset switch cables as well. And I'll show you where those plug in as well later on in the video so you can get an idea in case you're not aware and also HD audio. These are all tied down here, but you'll need to maneuver them around the case a little bit because some will go in the bottom and plug into the bottom of the power supply unit. It's also worth noting there is an RGB header cable that will need to be plugged into the RGB header on your motherboard. That gives access to then be able to control the RGB lighting strip, which just sits below the power supply unit. Included in the box, you also get a little box of extras, which is all the sort of screws for installing your power supply unit for installing the motherboard, for installing fans, and for other things. There is also a really nifty thing that you can see coming out here, which is a GPU mount bracket. And that mounts to the back of the case. Follow the instructions in the box for that. But essentially this is two parts of a bracket and then there's a screw that you will screw into the back of the case and it supports the bottom of the GPU on the far side to prevent it from sagging. You can see the parts necessary for that here is essentially some thumb screws, an extra screw, and then you just position a little rubber mount to push the GPU up. You'll see it at the end shots. Unfortunately, I didn't get a shot of installing it, but it is a wonderful little addition that makes a big difference. You'll also find this little tool here for installing standoff screws. So it's set up as standard to work with an ATX motherboard, but if you need to install a different sort of motherboard, there are additional standoff screws. More on that in a minute. These are the motherboard screws for holding the motherboard down. Then you have power supply unit screws. It's worth noting the box itself shows you what screws do what, so if you get confused, you can do that. There's some extra fan screws as well here that are included. So if you're mounting extra fans, then you can use those. And then you have the screws for the drives, so SSDs and hard disk drives. You have those there. And then some extra screws as well. And then this is the little tool once again for installing those extra standoffs or removing and installing the ones that are already there. Again, if you need to just reference the back of the little box because it shows you what parts are for what and what you need to use them for. But hopefully I'll cover off a lot of what is here as we go through and as I show you what to do. 
So this is going to be a very in-depth look at everything, including the simple things like mounting a hard disk drive. So you can see that these are held in place with thumb screws and a couple of clips on the back. And this is the process. Here I have a Toshiba 6 terabyte drive and you'll find the necessary screws. You can't make a mistake with the wrong ones here because they're flat and sort of long. You can see a little look at them here and they have a quite a large head on them. So you'll notice there's some rubber mounts on the inner edge and the outside of the drive bay that you've taken out and there's screw holes on either side of your hard disk drive where you basically need to line those up with each of those. So there's four points that you'll need to put the screws into to hold this drive in place and then it can be attached back into the case. So I'm shortening the process but essentially you're just making sure you put all those screws into the four corners. Now obviously you can mount two drives back there at the back of the case and then you'll need to run the cables for them as well. I'm just installing one in this instance, but you will note the way I've done it is where the power and the data connection head up towards the top, towards the motherboard, and you just slip that back in and lock it into place. You could potentially install it the other way up, maybe, where the cables would face downwards, but there's actually a limited amount of space for cables at the bottom, and you'll see that a bit later on when we go into a bit more depth on it. And then for the similar process for the SSDs, now I've taken that one off, but you can obviously choose which one you want to remove. Perhaps one at the bottom might be easier. These use different screws and you'll see them here, tiny little ones. So you're essentially just putting the SSD, installing it onto that tray and then again, putting it back in place. So these screws just go, once again, go into the four corners and you need to adjust it and make sure you have it in a position where you can access the ports to once again connect the data and power connections all four screws just into there and screwed down now it's really nice to have so many drives in this case the potential of it uh, i would recommend using nvme storage if you can because it involves less cables and less power and a lot more speed but these are pretty easy to mount and you'll know also because of the positioning of the ssds it's really easy to plug in power from the sata power at the top and also just plug into the motherboard. So this is an additional fan that I purchased. It's a 140 mil fractal fan, and I probably got the wrong one because this has white fins and all the other fans in the case have black ones, but I'll leave the specs in the description so you can purchase something similar if you're interested. I would highly recommend doing this though, because as standard, there is no exhaust fans in the case, as you'll notice, apart from the power supply unit. And that's because you'll mount the power supply unit with its fan facing downwards into the case so it has some air. So what will happen is cold air will be pulled in from the front and the bottom and it will go through the machine and try and exit out the back. But because there's no exhaust fan as standard, it will go either through these holes at the back or up and through your power supply unit, which I don't think is ideal because you're basically going to be putting warm or hot air through your power supply unit in order to then exit. So I think it's pretty essential to purchase at least one 140 mil fan for the rear to exhaust because that will help with exhausting some of that hot air out of the back and as you'll see from my setup i have the cpu air tower pointing that way as well so that will hopefully help with that one of the things that is worth noting though if you plug it in you'll find that the cable won't stretch the pwm controller so you either need an extension lead or you plug it into the system fan header on your motherboard also the fans that are pre-installed in the case do not have their connection set up with the PWM controller either. So you need to undo all those, route them through to the back and then plug them into that controller as well. And you can see there are nice spots for doing so. I put all mine through the same hole at the bottom three anyway. One thing you will also note that I'm not gonna show, but it is possible to do here. You'll see there's some thumb screws at the front of the case, just in front of those 140 mm fans. You can undo those, you can take the tray out. Then there's an included adapter that will suit for 120 mm fans instead should you want to switch out things there so you can uh, change the setup of it this case is designed to take thick radiators both on the front and the bottom so you could potentially install different size fans or radiators and fan combinations until your heart's content and as you'll see from later on there's some good space back there all the fans can be plugged in to this control box though and that obviously makes things a lot easier because that means that fans get power and the easy control with PWM motherboard control. So that's fairly straightforward. Again, the front fans also can be run through. And, then, and once again, you can see there's a hole, tiny hole just at the bottom for the bottom fan power cable. And I ran mine through there and it's actually really easy to hide that cable behind the fan as well. So most of the cabling at the front of this case 
is really easy to conceal and I think that's a brilliant addition to the setup. The design's well thought out in this way. You can also run the top fan up out the top and you'll see that there's a little hole hidden by the front panel connectors that run into the back that you can run that power connection out of and all the standard pre-install fan cables will reach to the PWM controller at the bottom which means you're minimizing the number of cables that need to come back through to the front to connect to the motherboard and therefore keeping things really neat which obviously helps with the airflow in the front and also just makes your case look really neat too. So just watch out when you're building because you will see there are a lot of different holes that you can potentially run things through into and you can make things as neat as possible and that's one of the highlights of the design. At the back you'll also see you have lots of different velcro tied loops in place so you can easily access and run cables in and I wouldn't recommend undoing those if you can help it until you need to and that just keeps all the cables in place while you're working with them and obviously you can try and manage things as best as possible. I think that the cable management is quite tricky in here and you do need to make sure you tie everything down very neatly and I'll show you what I mean a bit later on but it's quite narrow it looks really spacious when you start but by the time you've got all the power cables in there and other things it becomes a bit cramped and if you're installing multiple drives you might find that becomes an issue but this is the initial setup process so now I have all the fans plus the extra one connected it up to that control box and as a reminder that needs to connect to your motherboard on one of the system fan headers that's PWM controllable and to SATA power with the power supply unit which I'll show you the steps for that in a second. Once again I'm mounting the RM850X facing down into the case. The fan is facing down into the case which means it will suck air into it and it will then blow it out the rear. This means that the power supply unit is going to get air but it will potentially be warm air. Although, to be honest, from my experience running the case, I've found that cold air is going in well and it's not coming out that hot out of the rear. It is a very nice setup. This case runs very cool and surprisingly quiet. I'll talk a bit more about that later on, but I did cover it in the review, so if you've already seen that, you know that actually my experience is that the hard disk drives sometimes are louder than the fans which is definitely a compliment to the case design and the fan design of it. So this power supply unit is now mounted in the rear and then you need obviously to go through the process of installing all the different cables and this is the standard cables that are included with the case. You will note that I'll be using different ones, I'll explain why in a second, but obviously we need to make sure we have the 24 pin power supply unit for the case and that will be the main power connection for the motherboard and again you'll see that there is a lot of room up here so this is quite a roomy port for your power supply unit obviously means you have more room for a larger power supply so if you need a thousand watt for example you might find that it fits in i'll leave all the specs in the description so you can check to make sure what you want to put in here is compatible but you'll see there's quite a bit of room left in but one of the things i like about using this slightly smaller power supply unit is there's still plenty of room for the cables so if you need to hide some of the cables up there or at least a bit of the cable before you run it down as the case you can do that once you've got it through into the back though you obviously have the advantage of all the different hooks and loops so that you can run them in the direction that you need them to go in because obviously with this one it's going to run down the side of the case and go into the side of the motherboard which i'll show you in a little while and then I also have two 8-pin CPU power connections that need to run across the top and plug into the top of the motherboard, plus a 6-pin which goes in by the 24-pin, and then PCIe connections and other things as well which I'll show you. And again, they can all run down here and they will go off in different directions and that will then make the process a bit easier for tying things down, but you will see what I'm talking about in a second, but you can see already things are starting to come together here. So this is partly what I was talking about. You'll see I have some white cables in the mix here and that is because I'm going to be using some cable mod cables to make the front of the case look a bit nicer and they're extension cables that plug into the main power supply unit cables and then run through to the front. I also have some Corsair individually sleeved SATA power cables because they're just a bit nicer looking and those aren't going to be running to the front at all so I just wanted to use them at the back because they're a bit easier to move around. Now this is the SATA power connection is what you need for the PWM controller but also for your hard disk drive and your 2.5 inch SSDs and any other sort of fan power or adapters that you'll be using. 
and a quick look at the power supply unit connections, a close up just in case you're not aware of how this works. For the top right is the motherboard 24 pin that's split into two different ones and you have the 8 pin CPU that's clearly marked and you'll see on the power supply unit there's also markings for the CPU and PCIe connections so you plug those into there and then you'll run them into the top of the case and plug them into the power supply marked points on the motherboard and I'll show you those later on. We also have SATA power connections, which are, again, I'll show you in a minute. Now this motherboard in particular is the Z690 Maximus formula from ASUS. And that requires a lot of different power connections because of the potential overclocking capabilities of it. But most modern motherboards require the 24 pin and then two eight pin CPU connections. And then obviously you'll need to think about the other things you're installing, whether it's hard disk drives, in your graphics card and all those things as well. So there are a number of different connections on this power supply. This flat panel one is the SATA power connection and that obviously plugs in on the bottom left where the SATA connection is and then that can be daisy chained together so you'll see there's multiple connections on them so if you have multiple drives you can loop those in and you can plug in more than one drive to the one cable so you can see demonstration of how you plug in the hard disk drive there but you can also use that for your SATA connections. And then when I'm at this stage, I started with some of the cable management process. And I will say at this point, although you can see me doing it, I wouldn't recommend using the plastic cable ties because what I like to do personally is to make sure that everything's plugged in nicely first and the machine boots before I start this. And I'm actually making a good point of this at the moment because I did the opposite to what I just said because I was confident I was doing it right. And then I found there was a problem with one of my power supply cables so the machine wasn't booting because it wasn't getting power to the 24 pin connection. I ended up having to take some of these cables out and change them. Uh, it was actually the cable mod cable that was the problem, the adapter for the 24 pin, and that caused problems. But learn from my mistakes, don't use the plastic cable ties until you're sure that your machine is booting. Now you can see me running the connections for the SATA power to the SSD and also down to the bottom. You'll see things are already starting to get quite busy. Those cables that are running down to the bottom are quite thick and they're protruding quite a lot. And as I found at the end, that made things a bit difficult with putting the back on again. So I'm going to show you a sample bit of what I did to install the motherboard now. I'm using NVMe M2 drives in here. I've got a WD Black SN850 that I'm going to be installing on this motherboard. I'll do a video separately on this motherboard as well if you're interested. It's a very nice Z690 motherboard and it's going to be running Intel Core i9 12900K. Obviously, WD Black SN850 is a Gen 4 PCIe NVMe drive, so that boots nice and quickly. And I'm using that as my main OS drive. And then the installation for the Intel CPU. And this is a good test of the performance of the case and the cooler that I'm going to be using because this is a 12900K, which is renowned for running hot. My experiences with this CPU has been a great upgrade from the 11th gen and obviously comes with the benefit of DDR5, PCIe Gen 5 and multiple Gen 4 lanes on the motherboard as well. So you can run multiple NVMe drives on this setup. It's actually able to take five. I'm also using the Kingston Fury Beast DDR5 RAM. This is 6000 megahertz RAM and this is nice and stable and quick too. It's been ideal for video editing and other things reasonably easy installation process if you're not aware already the slots on this you need to use a2 and b2 so there's four dim slots but you're only using two because you have two sticks so they have to be installed a2 and b2 and here you can see some of the process and parts of that and this sets up now obviously this is potentially a liquid cooled motherboard you'll see there's ports on that for that so there may be future upgrades to this case or I go for a full liquid cooling system and contemplating that and the glory that that could offer because as you'll see there's a lot of room in here but for the moment I'm installing a Noctua Chromax Black NHD15 CPU tower which I've done a video on separately I'll link to in the description and this is some of the process for that so we have the back plate which installs on the rear for the LGA 1700 bracket the good thing about this motherboard is it's designed to take a multitude of different brackets so it'll actually work with the LGA 1200 socket so if you have a different 
radiator or cooling set up for your CPU, then you can still use it because there's two holes drilled into it. But the setup process here is fairly straightforward for this Noctua air cooler and it obviously has the benefit of working nicely with this case. This case is really just designed for something like this, either an air tower cooler or for a full liquid cooling system. And the reason for this is, in my mind, you wouldn't want a all-in-one cooler because if you mounted a 360mm radiator in it, you'd have to put it in the front, which means abandoning the 180mm fans in place of, say, for example, a 360mm rad with 320mm fans. And that means you've got less cold air coming into the case because you're going to be putting warm air in through the front and then cold air in from the bottom. And you couldn't mount an all-in-one radiator on the bottom because that would then mean that the pump head would be the highest point in the setup and you could potentially get air bubbles in the pump over time which could then lead to problems so really you want to use an air tower like i am or a full liquid cooling system for this case and this is part of the process for doing that so obviously applying thermal paste and setting up the cpu tower for the air cooling with this and actually the logic of this is pretty sound as well because they have obviously a large 180 mil fans sucking air in from the front two fans on the radiator that you'll see in a second pulling it across through the radiator and then the 140 mil fan from fractal that i've installed in there sucking warm air out the back and actually despite that number of fans and the size of them it actually runs really quiet unless you ramp it all the way out which i haven't found i've had to do very often also the noctua chromax black is one nice looking air tower the only downside of which, as you'll see, is that it now covers over what is a fantastic looking motherboard, which is mostly hidden by the air tower. As you'll see, once it's in the case and I've got the GPU installed, you basically can't see the motherboard anymore, which is a real shame. And one of the reasons that I might look to upgrade or change to a full liquid cooled system in the future. But it's actually an affordable CPU cooler with really good performance. So I think that is obviously a bonus of this setup and well worth considering it's also very nicely designed and is guaranteed up for six years and will work with a multitude of different socket setups so not only lga 1700 for intel's 12th gen but other ones as well including amd older intel sockets and more so it's a straightforward setup once you know the process and if you're curious to find out more about how this works and set up for it then i'll link to the video in the description where i went into the depth on how to build it and the things that you do but you can see some of the steps here obviously mounting the fan in the middle and on the back and installing the cables in the right place essentially this has uh, intelligent design that includes a y splitter cable that allows you to join those two fans together and then plug them into the cpu fan header on the motherboard and then you have control over that via motherboard software and BIOS to set the speed of those fans and adjust according to the temperature of the CPU. And it's a really straightforward process for setting that up and plugging it in, and then you're away. On the left-hand side, on the other side of the cables, you'll see the 8-pin CPU power connectors as well. So here the case is now I'm going to be obviously seating the motherboard down into it with the tower complete and what you will notice is despite it being an ATX motherboard uh, which is reasonably large size it, it's still nice and spacious in there there's plenty of room and uh, this I think the ATX is probably the ideal size for it because obviously you have the rubber areas where the cables will run through you also still have plenty of room for liquid cooling system so a reservoir can obviously go on the right hand side of that and one thing you'll notice is the various different brackets and holes on the right hand side of the rubber connectors and that is where your gpu bracket will mount as well and positions in nice and easily there so quick look at the power connectors on the right hand side next to the ram you'll see the power connector here and there's also a six pin power connector just below that these are the cable mod extension leads that i was using i got them because they look nice and neat and i thought they'd be fantastic but i actually can't recommend them unfortunately because this one was particularly problematic and my machine wouldn't power on when it was plugged in and uh, despite multiple attempts and it's quite frustrating i have used corsair's premium power supply unit kit in the past and had no dramas I wanted the cable mod one because it's a slightly neater look I think and I left most of the other cables in place but I had to replace this one so you'll notice that in a minute but anyway the point is you need to plug in your 24 pin power supply unit cable 
on the right hand side here that is very important because that gives the main power to the motherboard so it's really essential to plug that in and then obviously the two eight pin power connectors in the top left again these are the extension leads from cable mods so they plug into your motherboard run to the back and then connect to the other cables that we've already connected to the power supply unit and that just keeps things nice and neat the bonus of these is that they have various different clips that you can see that hold all the cables together and it makes everything look nice and neat and a much tidier look there's plenty of room to build in the case although i will note that as you'll see it is still fiddly to reach those 8 pin power connectors so it might actually be worth plugging those in before you put the motherboard into place especially if you're using extension leads like i am because then it'll make your life a bit easier i did find that there was room enough to run them into the back of the case but it was fiddly to plug them in especially with the air tower already connected that kind of got in the way and it was a bit uncomfortable now on the right hand side i'm showing you some of the other connections as well you'll see you have the usb connection i've run that from the back of the case that was hidden down the bottom there and that plugs in along the side here you'll notice that you have the data connections and usb connection and then just below the ram you'll see that silver one sticking up that is the usb c connection next to that six pin power connection and then the 24 pin power connection this is the usb connection for the front power usb a connections and that plugs in down the bottom there you might find it plugs in the front or the top but in this motherboard setup there are two of them and it's either the bottom there and this is the fan connection that I run from the pwm controller you need to find a system fan header on your motherboard and plug that in there and make sure that it has pwm capabilities these are the data cables for the ssds and for the hard drives there's the same sort of cables you'll find them with the motherboard usually and they plug in in one direction only you can't plug them in the wrong way around despite me attempting to there and then they run through to the front and they plug in just around where that fat usb cable was plugged in a minute ago the other front panel connections the hd audio gives you the audio jack connections for the front of your case that goes in the top and this plugs in, in the bottom left and you'll usually find these reference in the manual it's important to check because some motherboards are slightly different in where they plug in but again you can't plug this in wrong because it has one pin missing so you'll actually see if you compare it with what's on the motherboard where the holes line up with the pins and then you can plug that in there there are also RGB connections on the bottom there next to those, the white ones. You need to find the right one to plug the RGB connection from the top where the uh, strip is by the power supply unit that plugs in on the left hand side somewhere on those white connections. And then your front panel power connections, you see I have an adapter here with the power switch, power LED, reset switch. That plugs into that and then that plugs in down on the bottom right hand side of the motherboard. You might find you don't have an adapter, in which case you have to individually plug those in on the bottom right hand power socket. And that can be a little bit fiddly to work out which cable goes where. It's usually marked on the motherboard with lettering or in the motherboard manual. So a little bit of trouble, but it is plausible to do. And now we're nearing the end of the build and the setup. So now I'm going to go about the process of installing my graphics card. I'm using an RTX 3090 from Gigabyte, the OC Vision, which I was lucky enough to get for a retail price back in 2021. Uh, it was expensive and they're about to replace it with a TI as the flagship, which is upsetting. But oh, uh, here you can see it is glorious. Also, a really good fit for this case because it uh, sits with that white theme and what you'll also note is there is a lot of extra space as well it has plenty of space on the right hand side for example and then obviously two eight pin power PCIe power cables will need to be plugged in running from the back of the case also, as I said earlier, and really important point, you don't miss this because it is a wonderful addition, is those lines that you can see on the back of the case behind the GPU, that is where those GPU bracket mounts into. And then that then pushes on the bottom side of the GPU to hold it up and prevent sag over time. It actually makes things look very, very nice and really clean. And these cable mod cables do look the part as well, I will say. I'm a bit frustrated that I couldn't get the 24 pin one to work, but the rest of them look really good and add a nice clean aesthetic to the case and not a massive expense extra on top of the other purchases that you'll make and here you can see the back of the case and the shame of my cable management i'm not good at cable managing but there is a reason why i leave it messy is to demonstrate how difficult it's going to be and also because to be honest 
I am in future thinking of upgrading and changing things in here because I'm often doing videos. I don't want to plastic tie everything down, but you can see just how messy things can get with just two drives. So there's quite a lot of mess going on at the back there. So I'd recommend if you can using NVMe drives. This motherboard also has an M2 expander card. This card can take two PCIe Gen 4 SSDs and will plug into your X16 slot on the bottom and run them at X4 speed. So you can still get your Gen 4 NVMe drives to run at a maximum speed despite being an expander card and plugged in the bottom. And this way you can get five NVMe's installed in your system with this particular setup. And that is what that tiny little thing is in case people were wondering when they're watching this video. Now, one of the things that's a nice highlight to this build that I didn't show here is that you'll notice if you look carefully that there are some Velcro loops around the outside run down the bottom of the case. These are ideal for mounting your cables in. So you run the power supply unit cable, your obviously your graphics card cables, your mouse cables, whatever else run them through those loops and keep everything really neat and tidy at the back of your case, unlike the installed cables in the back from mine. Um, that then will keep things neat on your desk. And here you can see the finished product, which I'll be honest, I'm very happy with. There are some problems that my 24 pin cable doesn't match the rest. And obviously I've got a one white fan and the rest are black, but the way I've positioned it on my desk, I can't really see that most of the time. I do wish I'd purchased the RGB fans for this case. I think it would have been a nice upgrade, but that is quite an expense. You can fit two 180 mil fans on the bottom. So you could also go for larger fans on the bottom as well as a potential option. And the overall finish, I'm still really pleased with. It's a very nice looking case. It's also surprisingly lightweight, both with the build in it and without. So it's really lightweight, but also very well thought out and interestingly designed. Obviously very little in the way of RGB, apart from that one lighting strip just below the power supply unit, but otherwise a very clean aesthetic and obviously has great airflow because of the sheer size of it. It's also remarkably easy to build in, apart from the cable management at the rear, which does get a little bit tricky. But otherwise you have lots of different ports and places to run your cables. There's lots of room. The inclusion of the PWM controller makes life really straightforward. And you obviously have a nice view into the case with a tempered glass. Now, obviously, if you're not a fan of that, you can get the one without the tempered glass panel. And that is an option. But I think that this should be a decent case for my main machine for quite some time. The large dust filter should also help keep it nice and clean over time as well. Now I ran Cinebench R23 to benchmark the CPU and show the performance of that in this case. And obviously this is going to vary depending on what CPU you've got, what motherboard you've got, what cooler you're using and what other, other things, environmental factors. So you need to take it with a pinch of salt. But I found it ran up 98 degrees C. The Core i9-12900K does run very hot though. So this isn't detriment to the case or even the cooler. I did do a video separately on undervolting the CPU and dropping the temps quite significantly. That's worth checking out if you're thinking about running a similar build, but it's worth bearing in mind that you don't need to panic. Cinebench is known for pushing CPUs to their limits. This CPU is also known to run really hot as well. Under normal load playing games, I found that I was maxing out around 70 degrees C on the CPU and the GPU, depending on what games I was playing and what I was doing, and also the temperature of the room and other things, and like how fast the fans are spinning. But I found it wasn't running hot. It's also performed really well even when it is running hot, so I haven't had any system stability issues or any other problems. I also ran a benchmark with Heaven, which I'll let you see the stats on. And if you're interested in seeing things like the decibel test with the setup with the fans, then please check out the review if you've not seen that already to find out a bit more on that. This has been the Provoke Prawn. I hope you found this video useful. If you've made it this far in the video and you've enjoyed it or found it helpful in any way, please smash that like button and subscribe if you're not subscribed already. Drop me a comment to let me know what you liked the most and what you hated and any tips on what you think you'd like to see in future videos. This has been the Provoke Prawn. Thanks very much for watching. Appreciate you. Have a great life. 
This has been the Provoke Prawn. Hope you found this video useful, interesting, hilarious, or otherwise. Take a look at these other videos that I think you might find interesting as well. And have a look at the description for links and other information you might find useful. Click that join button to see the benefits of being a member of my YouTube channel. And most importantly, have a great life.